Hello and welcome to The Lincoln Journey. Today, in episode 21 of The Conspirators, we will examine the trial of Mary Surratt, the Surratt that didn't get away. Let's go back to the night of the shooting. Purportedly acting on an anonymous tip that, quote, if you want to find out all about this business, go to Mrs. Surratt's house on H Street, unquote, police detectives James McDevitt John Clarvo and others rousted the house at about 2.30 a.m. They searched the building for Booth and John Surratt. They were convinced that Surratt had been William Seward's attacker. When Lewis Weichmann asked for the meaning of the intrusion, a detective exclaimed, do you pretend that you do not know what has happened? When told of the attacks on Lincoln and Seward, Weichmann threw up his hands and said, my God, I see it all. He took the detectives to another floor where Mary waited in a parlor and said to her, Mrs. Surratt, what do you think? Booth has murdered the president. Mary responded, my God, Mr. Weichmann, you do not tell me so. Now, I don't want to get things too confused, but I want to point out that when Mary's son, John, was on trial two years later, evidence was introduced that two Union soldiers claimed that earlier that night, Mary called from her window as they walked past to ask, what is wrong downtown? The soldiers told her that John Wilkes Booth had shot the president. So her surprise expressed to Weichmann seems to have been feigned. After breakfast on Saturday morning, Weichmann went with another rumor, John Holohan, to Metropolitan Police Headquarters to report on Booth's frequent visits to their boarding house and perhaps to prevent suspicion from falling on themselves. At this point, Weichmann says he did not suspect Mary or John Surratt of being involved in the assassination. But the police, finding in their laps two acquaintances of multiple suspects, basically deputized Weichmann and Holohan, taking them along for a quick foray into Southern Maryland, and then, I kid you not, sending them with McDevitt and another detective to look for John Surratt in Canada. You may be thinking, what is this, some kind of TV show? Jessica Fletcher gets to tag along because she saw a clue? Well, that's what Secretary of State Stanton said, more or less. He was incensed that the two witnesses had been allowed to leave the country, especially since some interviewees were raising suspicions about Weichmann. Upon his return from Canada, Weichmann was quickly ushered before Stanton himself who questioned him brusquely and quickly learned that the young man could tie Booth to Dr. Samuel Mudd, along with other witnesses, suspects, and suspicious types who could swing either way. The authorities ensconced Weichmann in the Carol Annex, and his effects and background were minutely searched. I'm not ignoring Mary Surratt. Lewis Weichmann requires further examination because, as previously noted, this testimony was very key to Mary's conviction. If Mary was innocent, Lewis was lying his pants off. How can we decide who was lying and who wasn't? I propose that we look at the key incriminating statements that Weichmann made about Mary Surratt and see if they are supported by other facts or avowals. Weichmann said that Mary was very familiar with Booth and that while Booth came to her house to see her son, if he was not there, Booth would talk to her, often alone and often for extended periods. Mary's daughter, Anna, testified that Booth, quote, never stayed long when he came, unquote, but the last she knew of him being there was April 14th, the day of the assassination, when her brother was in Canada. Booth was likely there three times that day. Border Honora Fitzpatrick said, the last time I saw Mr. Booth at Mrs. Surratt's was on the Monday before the assassination. John Surratt had left a fortnight before, and I never saw him after. John Holohan's wife, Eliza, testified, I have seen John Wilkes Booth at Mrs. Surratt's three or four times, 
When he called, he spent most of his time in company with Mrs. Surratt, I believe. He would ask for Mr. John Surratt, as I understand, if he was not there for Mrs. Surratt. Weichmann described two trips he took with Mary to Surrattsville the week of the assassination. It was a buggy ride of about two hours each way. Mary told him that the visits were for the purpose of collecting a debt, and even had him pen a letter for her to John Nothy, who owed her money for a piece of property he purchased from her husband. She was in particular earnest to receive the money owed because one of her own creditors was pressing her for payment. On the first trip, on Monday, April 9th, they met John Lloyd driving in the opposite direction. Lloyd, you will remember, operated the Surratt Tavern at Surrattsville under a rental agreement with Mary. Lloyd alighted from his carriage and walked to Surratt's rental, paid for by Booth, incidentally. Weichmann said that Mary stuck her head out of the buggy and spoke so quietly to Lloyd that Weichmann couldn't tell what she said. This links up with Lloyd's testimony that at this chance meeting, Surratt asked him about the articles at the tavern. This mystified him. Then she came out plainer, Lloyd testified, and asked me about the shooting irons, the carbines that John Jr., Harold, and Atzerott had left there several weeks earlier. He told her that they were still hidden, and he would just as soon have buried them as they made him very uneasy. Mary told him to get them out ready, that they would be wanted soon. Mary and Lewis continued on their business trip, and Mary did meet Nothi at the tavern, but their transaction was not resolved. Weichmann said they duplicated the trip on Friday the 14th. Just as he went to pick up the carriage at about 2 o'clock p.m., Booth arrived, and Booth was there when he got back. Before setting out, he saw Mary talking to Booth for three or four minutes, and he gave her a package. This time, when they arrived, Nothi was not there, nor had he been told to expect her. He lived only three miles away, but instead of going to his home, Mary left a letter for him at the tavern. But when she learned that John Lloyd was not there, she bided her time until he arrived. Lloyd picks up the story from here. This is where she approached Lloyd and appears to have tried to jolly him up by saying, talk about the devil and his imps will appear. Lloyd says he responded, I was not aware that I was a devil before. Was he just exchanging witty repartee with Mary, or was he being sullen? Was he dreading that she would bring up the shooting irons again? By the way, I should mention that he was drunk. His sister-in-law said he was very much in liquor, more so than I have ever seen him in my life. Others testified that he was drunk before he arrived home with a load of oysters and fish for the tavern. Lloyd recalled Mary then saying, Well, Mr. Lloyd, I want you to have those shooting irons ready. There will be parties here tonight who will call for them. He was also to give them two bottles of whiskey and Booth's package, which turned out to contain an impressive pair of binoculars. Was Lloyd too drunk to be a reliable witness to all these details? Perhaps, perhaps not. But as Mary and Lewis prepared to leave, the spring on their carriage broke. John Lloyd was competent enough in his intoxication to jury-rig the buggy for the ride home, so let's give him some credit. Back at the boarding house, someone rang the doorbell at 8.30 or 9 p.m. Weichmann volunteered to answer it, but Mary insisted on answering it herself. Weichmann couldn't tell who it was, but heard footsteps enter the parlor and leave after a few minutes. If all of our other suspicions are true, then it would make sense that Booth would check in before his date with Destiny to see if the arrangements were made for his trip later that night through Surrattsville. Not all of the evidence came from Weichmann. Both shortly before and on April 14th, the day of the assassination, Anna Ward, whom I kept seeing referred to as John Surratt's sometimes girlfriend, received two letters from John in which were enclosed letters to his mother. Ward said they were both postmarked Montreal. She said she took the four letters to Mary on the 14th. Mary told the police that she knew her son was in Montreal because she had received mail from him sent from there. But when they asked her to produce the letters, she said she had lost them. While possible, this seems highly unlikely. 
She had just read excerpts from them to the household at dinner. It seems more likely that the letters included incriminating evidence, maybe about the plot, maybe just about John's covert work for the Confederacy. Exposing John's spy work would probably have seemed of little consequence if it could absolve him of stabbing several people at Secretary Seward's house. While it is doubtful that John Surratt knew about the attacks, having been away for so long, in his ignorance of the impending climax, he may have referenced the Surratt's intimacy with Booth. In any case, Mary didn't want the police to see those letters, even with her son's life and hers in the balance. And then there's the story told by Richard Smoot, albeit nearly 40 years later. Smoot was a blockade runner in the Port Tobacco area, and John Surratt had bought his large boat for $250, putting on $125 in trust with a former judge in the area. Surratt explained only that, quote, the need of the boat would be of the consequence of an event of unprecedented magnitude in the history of the country which would startle and astound the entire world." Unquote. Smoot didn't suspect an assassination, but he wrote, I was inclined to associate the coming event with a plan to abduct Lincoln, concerning which plan I had heard vague rumors. Which raises the question, are you a conspirator if you are voluntarily aiding a conspiracy, but you have to guess the object of the conspiracy? In any case, he may have been willing to assist such an undertaking, but not without recompense. When Surratt wouldn't come round with the second half of the money, Smoot set about trying to collect it. On Wednesday, April 12th, he went looking for John at the house on H Street, but had to settle for an interview with Mary. She received him icily until he identified himself as the boat seller. Then, in an instant, her whole demeanor changed, extending to Smoot a most cordial greeting Mary demonstrated a familiarity with the boat and its intended usage and said it might be employed that night. Regardless, he should return on Friday when she expected John to be back. Smoot did indeed return on Friday, arriving at the boarding house at about 9.30 p.m. He found Mary, quote, in a state of feverish excitement. I asked her if John had returned and she replied that he had not. She then informed me that she was positive that the boat would be used that night and that I would get my money in a day or two. She most earnestly besought me to leave the city and not to be seen at her house again. Her manner caused me alarm. I felt that a crisis was at hand and that I was facing some unseen danger. I left the house and went downtown, feeling that it was imperative that I should get out of the city in the shortest possible time." Unquote. This was maybe an hour after Mary had a short private talk with someone in the front parlor, presumably Booth, and an hour before the assassination. If Smoot's memory is to be trusted, Mary was aware that a boat had been engaged to cross the Potomac, and she knew that the passage was imminent. We must consider the possibility that Booth was deceiving her into thinking the conspiracy still involved kidnapping rather than murder. But, like I said before, if a death results, you're guilty of murder either way. The authorities returned to Mary's house on Sunday night the 16th to arrest anyone there. Weichmann wasn't in, he was out being Jessica Fletcher. But the police received a bonus when Lewis Powell showed up just before they left. Mary was out of the hallway when the detectives questioned Powell, who said he was there to dig a gutter for Mrs. Surratt the following morning. Mary was then brought in and asked if she knew him and engaged him. Standing three feet away, Mary raised her right hand and said, Before God, sir, I do not know this man and have never seen him, and I did not hire him to dig a gutter for me. This despite Powell's numerous visits to her house. Later, in the face of overwhelming evidence that she and Powell were acquainted, Mary's lawyers presented several witnesses who testified to her poor eyesight. Her dramatic response to Powell's walking in on her arrest indicates instead that she was shocked to see Powell at exactly the wrong time. They clearly shared a secret. John Lloyd testified with descriptions of Mary's visits that matched Weichmann's. He had initially stonewalled because he was afraid the conspirators would kill him in revenge. And when he gave in, 
he thought he had leaped from the frying pan to the fire. His arresting officer testified, he commenced crying and hallowing out, oh, Mrs. Surratt, that vile woman, she has ruined me. I am to be shot. I am to be shot. As John Fazio puts it in Decapitating the Union, if Mary's trips to Surrattsville and her instructions to Lloyd demonstrate that she knew Booth's planned escape route, which is the only reasonable meaning one can take from the same, then how can it be said that she was not part of the conspiracy? As compelling as that last question may be, it still draws attention to the lack of hard evidence. Mary didn't shoot someone and shout sick semper tyrannis. She didn't stab someone repeatedly in the neck and face. And while her conversations with Weichmann, Lloyd, and Smoot strongly suggest her involvement in the conspiracy, none of them heard her say anything overt. You would think that with a good lawyer, she could have escaped execution. Well, she actually had one of the best lawyers around. So what went wrong? Mary was immediately able to engage Maryland Senator Reverdy Johnson for her defense. Johnson had been U.S. Attorney General under President Zachary Taylor and was a celebrated defense attorney, representing, among others, John Sanford in the infamous Dred Scott v. Sanford case. Johnson stated that he was as anxious as anyone to see justice done on those guilty of assassinating the president, and while he would, quote, do whatever the evidence will justify me in doing in protecting this lady, unquote, he would not, quote, protect anyone whom, when the evidence is offered, I shall deem to have been guilty, even her, unquote. What the evidence justified him in doing was to attack the legality of a military commission in a long-winded argument that was never going to be taken seriously. He took no part in the examination of witnesses, leaving it to two very inexperienced attorneys, Frederick Aiken and John Clampett, who made blunder after blunder. They called a number of character witnesses, many of them priests, who were obliged by the prosecution to admit that they didn't know Mary well or had little or no contact with her for years. They called other witnesses whose testimony ended up hurting more than helping. An example. Aiken put questions to boarding house resident Eliza Holohan to establish that Booth went to the Surratt house in order to converse with John Surratt, not Mary. When Eliza couldn't specify the number of times that Booth had visited, Aiken coaxed her by saying, did he spend most of the time when he came there in company with Mrs. Surratt, hoping for a no answer? Instead, Eliza said yes. He would ask for Mr. John Surratt, as I understood, if he was not there for Mrs. Surratt. Not helping, guys. In addition to her other woes, Mary became very ill during the trial. She had a gynecological ailment that may have been endometriosis. For her better care, Mary was moved from her cell to a larger room next to the courtroom, and her daughter Anna was allowed to stay with her. This was another compassionate gesture by prison commandant General John Hartram. I'm not including some of the incriminating things that Lewis Weichmann claims that Mary said because there's no corroboration for them. Stressing that caveat, I will include one that he didn't mention at the trial, but that he included in his book, which Floyd E. Risvold edited and published for him in 1975, 73 years after his death, entitled A True History of the Assassination of Abraham Lincoln and of the Conspiracy of 1865. When they returned from Surrattsville the evening of April 14th, Weichmann recalls, when about a mile from the city and having from the top of a hill caught view of Washington swimming in a flood of light, raising her hand, she said, I am afraid all this rejoicing will be turned into mourning and all this glory into sadness. I asked her what she meant, and she replied that after sunshine there was always a storm and that the people were too proud and licentious, and that God would punish them. Mary was found guilty by at least six commissioners, meaning she would suffer death. But five of the commissioners immediately petitioned Andrew Johnson to commute her sentence in light of her sex and age to life in prison. She was the first woman to be executed by the U.S. government, 
but I don't know what the age thing was. I doubt she was the first 42-year-old. Johnson later denied ever seeing the petition, but the weight of the evidence, if you will, strongly indicates that he saw it and denied it. Judge Advocate General Joseph Holt reported that Johnson told him, she must be punished with the rest, that no reasons were given for his in interposition by those asking for clemency in her case, except age and sex. Should Mary Surratt have been executed? No. Capital punishment is wrong. But was she as guilty as the others who were executed? Quite probably. The evidence strongly suggests that she was aware of and was actively contributing to a plot to assassinate the president. In this, the Surratt who didn't get away was as guilty as Powell, Atzerodt, and Harold. How does the Surratt who got away measure up in this respect? Do I mean the one who hid in Canada and ran off to Europe and left his mother to hang? Yeah, that's the one I mean. First we will deal with hanging day, then we will deal with him. See you next time for episode 22 of The Conspirators. Thank you.